Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to the Placebo Effect for Negroes, a reply path one. And this very important notice to you, our dear viewer, that it is never our intention to offend anyone with our videos. It is not also our intention to suggest, insinuate or preach hate towards any group, race, tribe or person. There is also no propaganda or any deliberate attempt to misinform anyone with our videos. The goal is for you to look for the books, journals, magazines or other publications referenced and study them yourself. Remember, Negroes, sweet and docile, make humble and kind. Beware the day they change their mind. Langston Hughes And from our brother, Hubert Harrison, it should seem that Negroes of all Americans would be found in the free thought fold, since they have suffered more than any other class of Americans from the dubious blessings of Christianity. And here is an errata from part one of the placebo effect for Negroes we said we had not seen the word Fulani until around 1850s, but we meant 1750s. It was a narrator error. Our apologies. Again, we quoted then Calloway as saying slavery was employment, whereas he said slave trade was employment. And remember that slavery is different from slave trade. And again, it goes on to show exactly where the Indian wannabes and Aboriginal wannabes are heading to which we shall address in subsequent videos because they understand that difference and that's why they are targeting that difference to deceive and confuse everyone. Also, one of our notes said slave masters media reported killings as class instead of clash which was a typo and also a note that the woolly hair of the Negro is different from the straight hair of the Indian, Indian mulatto actually. And remember, we did say the woolly hair of the Indian, which would suggest Indians had woolly hair, whereas they actually have straight hair. The only time you see the images being propagated by the likes of young Pharaoh and Dane, who are clearly now working for the slave masters, are pictures of mulattoes on the negro women and indian men so to say so the indian slave master slept with the negro slaves at that time to produce what is akin to the mulattoes when the slave master slept with a negro woman if you look at the likes of malcolm x even the likes of mlk that was the same thing so that's how they got what they had as them um, maroons, quadroons, mulattoes and all that. So you understand what they are playing at. Notice that the image used by young Pharaoh to show you how dark Indians look like is the same image used by Dane Calloway. So that should show you that they are all working from the same source. Remember, in order to work for the slave master, you must be dead to the truth. You have to be dead to your conscience as well. So that's why you notice that they are lying. And notice again that they can't produce more than one or two images of such so-called dark Indians because there are no such thing. So that's why you see them presenting you those pictures. Then in the other pictures, you see them presenting Indians and Negroes side by side because ultimately the goal and target of the slave master, like we told you, he is never smart. It's just that he knows where the fools live. That's all. Is to obliterate the Negro identity which is what they have been working on for years. So when you talk about apostolic succession in your church, the slave master has apostolic succession in slavery, which the Negroes do not have. So it's that continuity that leverage on the absence of it on the Negro side of things. That's just what is happening. Nothing super advanced. Remember, the foot soldiers show a clear lack of intelligence and common sense and they are treacherous follow only one pattern. They follow the same pattern all the time. For example, they would dress in Biafra army uniform, massacre people, and the BBC helps them to say it was done by Biafran army. That's just how they do. The same thing they do. They will be doing anything you see them do follows the same pattern. They hunt, raid, capture, and export Negroes as slaves. Then the slave master helps them to say they did it themselves. 
So you need to bear this in mind. We challenge you to conduct a research on it as well. And then, most recently, they invaded a lawyer's house, burned the house, killed people, and then released pictures of two policemen allegedly killed in the attack by them. So now, you might think that, oh, this looks like a conspiracy. There is no conspiracy in it. All you need to do is look at their pedigree, look at their obvious lack of intelligence and, and um, common sense, then you will see what is happening. Now, remember, it was these their attitudes and actions that made the slave master at that time believe that the Negroes were beasts like cattle. At that time, the slave hunters were telling others who were wondering how people could be selling themselves. So they told them that the Negroes were beasts. They lived on threes. They were created by God to come and be beasts of burden to them like sheep and cattle. If you want to kill them when you're coming, they won't even see you. The same way cattle grazes, that's who they are. So that's why they strip them naked and give them those clothes. You see the slave images so that you don't think there is anything we are telling you here that you can't verify. So that way they land them in the new world as beasts that were without anything. And remember, because they were not speaking the slave master's languages, there was no way to ascertain the facts from the group. So again, remember also that at that time, it was the biggest business, just like you have oil companies today. So imagine fighting companies like Shell, Chevron, Ajib, Slumbeji, all those companies that you see in the Niger Delta, because that's the same way they were capturing the slaves from and shipping them from. Then shipping them to Elmina Castle for seasoning and all that. So you need to bear in mind what they did. So that's why they were able to do it. Because in this case now, you will see that when they report what they did to the slave master who is their sponsor, those days as in during the slave trade, they would have said, you see that the Negro was like cattle. Those Negro police officers were sitting in a police van. People came and set it on fire. They were just sitting there. Fire burnt the van and burnt them alongside. So everybody will believe because for you to believe that, you will certainly see that there is no way somebody will be sitting in a van, a mob comes and sets fire on the van, and they still remain on that van. So that's how their lives collapse. So now, when you hear it from another side, you will think it's a conspiracy. That's the game. The slave master is hiding behind them, no doubt about it. He simply leverages on their obvious lack of common sense and humanity. They can murder 500 people just to show you that a gun works. That's who they are. If you doubt what we're saying, conduct your research. Remember, we had asked the question if the Fulanese were the Moors renamed, and if not, where are the Moors today? Because they were the biggest predators and biggest slave hunters at that time, and that attracted some comments from some Fulanese or some of their foot soldiers. And here we see one of the comments from Best Less Casual Gamer who we already know from his comments is either a Fulani or their foot soldiers or contracted by them as a conditioned Negro to come and defend them. So he says, The best Moors are a Caucasian race, i.e. some of them had red hairs and blue eyes and all of them did not mix with Arabs, some mixed with Negroes. Now please remember that this person speaking here wasn't born by then. He might just be less than 30 years. Just like the likes of Dane or Young Pharaoh who will stand up to tell you Indians are now the same as Negroes because they have been conditioned and told what they want them to propagate. You need to bear this in mind. So when you read what they write without putting it in right perspective, you will be deceived. So you see how he's writing as if he was there. They are masters. It's called Takia in Islam, propaganda in Christianity. So the other person he goes further to tell was that I have read the books and they tell me that Fulanese and Moors through Barbers are different people. Note, he wants to say Fulanese are not Barbers. Fulani is also the correct name of the group, the true form of Pulani and Pul, the name they call themselves, being the root. So bear this in mind, he didn't provide any citations, but we are going to show you some of the names of the group. He also goes further to say, Moors descended from white-skinned Caucasian Barbers, while Fulanese are a Dravidian race, meaning the Fulanese are also Caucasians, both with dark skins. Read this book. He put a book he probably read, but let's just move forward. And he says, yes, 
I was just minding my own business when I came across it. If they really wanted to hide something from a Negro, maybe a book is not the best place to put it. Now remember, they are claiming to be Negroes as well. The same way the Indian wannabes and Aboriginal wannabes are claiming to be Indians. That's the same way these ones are claiming to be Negroes. Remember, the target is the Negroes. If they obliterate the Negro identity, then they will wipe out the slave trade from the history records. That's just the game. So the slave master will no longer have that ugly blot of being a slave hunter in the past, which is obviously making his religion much more unpopular. And that's why you see them contracting the likes of Kanye West to come and see how they can popularize whatever they have sold to you. That dummy. That's what they are doing now. You may not understand it. You might not believe it. But if you research it, you will understand it. And further down, we replied him, telling him or her that the Fulanese are also of the Barbaries. So if you're telling us that the Barbers are Caucasians and the Fulanese are from the same Barbers, so effectively you have told us the Fulanese are, are Caucasians. But then, remember when we first cited the book that wrote the same thing many months ago, they were all over the place claiming that it's a lie that Fulanese are Negroes. That's the same way you notice that their foot soldiers in the Americas, Europe or elsewhere are now claiming that the Negroes are Aborigines. So you need to understand how sophisticated the slave master and their foot soldiers think they are or they want to be. You notice how young Pharaoh after a few months of agreeing with them came out with his own fraud that they were the same and that these are the dark indians this is what they look like yet they see the long hair there which is just when the negro woman sleeps with an indian man because if you look at physique wise that is the stature of the negro or the so-called african-american is totally different from that of the indian which we can look at in subsequent editions because these things are well documented even apart from the woolly hair the physique the stature totally different so to our comment he now replied whether they are black caucasians or white caucasians in bracket barbers doesn't really matter what matters is that a place like nigeria is ruled by a caucasian race now you start wondering what exactly is this person driving at he keeps fighting for them to insist that they only raided the north. And another group he concocted, remember they are very good at fabricating lies. We had asked for a citation showing this name that he concocted since he wasn't born by then. He has been unable to provide one single citation. So he goes further to tell us that the Fulanese are dark Caucasians from Asia. I've seen a fair skinned Fulani but I've never seen a white Fulani before. I've also never defended the Fulanese. I'm just stating facts. The people who raided and sold millions of Igbos at the Bites of Biafra and Benin where they are Paz, are Paz or Farochuku, know this very well. Some of these names he's mentioning did not exist in the 13th or 14th century when the slavery started. So we wonder where he's getting them from. No citation whatsoever. That's how their lies work. So they propagate this thing. You will think they are joking. They will not go and smuggle it into this academic curriculum and then start teaching it to children so while you are thinking that you are just debating them you don't know that they have already done their groundwork they have put it in the classrooms you won't know your children will come back from school they are taught these things because they understand this game well that's why you see the full and is doing the same thing in nigeria if you doubt what we're telling you ask any phd holder in nigeria that you know including in african history who captured and sold the slaves he's gonna tell you it's this bunch of priests now you wonder why because that's what they were told as children that they were behind the slave raids and slave hunts whereas it was the nigerian army that you see today which we are going to still prove further here on this note but then he goes further to say the apas and apas or kwararafa wherever that is and the Beni kingdom you see where he's pushing his own no records show anything any of these or no citations whatsoever then he goes further to say, the only kings to kings missing in the picture, Prince Charles of England took with the Obi of Onesha, the Sultan of Sokoto, the Esu of Nupe, the Oyoni of Ife, the Emir of Kano, the Shehu of Bronu, and the Oba of Benin is Eze Aro, and maybe Ezenri also. That would have made a good family portrait. Now, what he's trying to insinuate here is that those kings he has just mentioned 
were the slave hunters as well to add to the pile. Now, look at somebody that is not defending the Fulani, but he's mentioning kings that were not even recorded anywhere in history, from the priests being behind it to these ones. But normally, when they lie, because they, like the slave master said, there are some things lacking, which they, we can't just say bluntly, out of respect, they enjoy lying more than anything else. That's just all we can say for now. But you can see all he has said, and then he has put on the kings he claims that were the slave hunters, supposedly. Now remember, almost all the kings there were appointed by the slave masters. Previously, the Europeans and Arabs, then later by the Fulanese, which we are going to show shortly anyway, so you will see it yourself, well documented. They read these things, but because of who they are, they don't understand what they read. Further down, he claims that he not to forget the Atta of Egala, the King of Boni, the Olu of Wari, the Obi of Abo, and the list goes on. So ultimately, just for the length of the video, we would have shown you where the slave hunters came to the Bath of Biafra, and it was the Europeans at that time. They came with their troops. We will show you one of these days, but then, just so we don't digress from these more questions and their comments, let's just move forward. Most of these people that they are, he is mentioning here were appointed not too long ago by the slave master's foot soldiers. Remember how they will create a state from an existing group and then put governors in them. That's the same way these things are being appointed because it is a sophisticated game but their secret is hidden in plain sight which we will continue to show you. Here is another comment from a different person called Gerald Thomas. So you need to understand who they are and how they operate. Our interest is for you to understand the game. And he says, that don't even sound right. I am Fulani and I am in the USA black man. So what are you talking about, dude? You reading something from 1930 or 1960 Fulani, also called Paul or Fulbi. And the Maghrebi ancestors of the Fulani and Paul is the from the tribe of Benjamin or the tribe of Dan so don't believe this bullshit so all my black people stop believing that crazy stuff look up Paul the apostle in Roman 11 1 so my ancestors just dropped out of sky in America and landed on the white man plantation really so I just saying do your own research go back to the 1200 or 1300 the Baba people Beta Israel of Ethiopia look that up so now you see the thing that's how they are you see how he's claiming that his people got there his Fulani and all that why don't you ask yourself out of the numerous ethnicities and groups in that region how come they are the only people struggling identifying themselves as who they are in that new world and at the same time defending their Fulani even when the books are saying something different Notice also that he's saying that the books are wrong because they were written back in time. That's who they are. The slave master understands this perfectly and we shall show you where they are documented as well shortly. So let us quickly reference the missionary history of Sierra Leone by the Reverend Henry Sidal and it was published 1874 and there it tells us that the Fula, that's the Fulanese, arrests attention by his strong Arab and occasionally Roman figures. That means sometimes they look like Arabs, sometimes they look like whites. Now remember, we are wondering if they were the Moors. Bear this in mind. And he goes further to say, the long ringlets that hang down to his shoulders, his thoughtful eye, his measured step, and his rosary of beads generally carried in his hand. You cannot mistake him. He is a disciple of the prophet of Mecca. He is the gold merchant of the coast. And he is more than suspected of being a slave merchant too. He says he is suspected. Note this well. It is important to bear in mind that the proper fullers are not of the Negro race. Nor are they the original inhabitants of the countries in which they live. Their features are European. So this guy now that is saying, oh they are this, they are that, they are dark, they are from where. He has not provided very good citations, but that's by the way. Now you notice that they say their features are European because of their nose, their lips, and of course their hair. But then, these ones that you see that are very dark today, they are not real Fulanese. They are like mulattoes, just the same way you see some Indians they claim are dark, but they have long hair, like the Indian long hair. Those are products of the slave master and the Negro slave woman. 
which was what they were doing, which we shall show you, or you can conduct the research yourself. Don't listen to what they are saying. Remember, when they bring in religion to anything about the Negro, they all understand that the Negro is very religious. But we remind you that the Most High did not write any book and never said it wrote any book. Spirits do not write books. Even by inspiration, it can be so imperfect and still claim to have been inspired. We leave that apart for another day. But then, reading for that, it says, Their hair is straight and silky, and their skin of a tawny hue, inclining to copper. Now, if you have watched or followed the Indian and Aboriginal wannabes, you hear them all shouting copper color, copper color, based on one man, Christopher Columbus. They didn't see his writing. They didn't see where he recorded it. All they understand is that one slave master's foot soldier is claiming that he wrote it in a diary that is hidden from them. Because the slave master understands that the Negro listens to whatever he's saying. If you look at, for example, their invasion of a lawyer's house in Nigeria, you would discover that they did, they burnt the house, they killed people, they killed animals, but then they presented a picture to the world that these two police officers were killed by. IPOB, indigenous people of Biafra, you would say. Now, on the surface, you might think they are saying the truth. No, they probably just killed those two people for nothing. They planned it. So if you're a Negro serving in their forces, you should know that you run the risk of being killed the same way too. So now, they present it, they know that whatever they do, the Negro listens to what they are saying, not the circumstances, not what the Negro sees. We'll give you a little example in a subsequent video. You remember that there were places they couldn't even capture slaves from because they were assumed to have supernatural powers. Now, why not tell us where those people are and why the Negro would leave his own creator that he worshipped at that time and follow the slave masters, um, deities and uh, gods. So you understand what we're talking about. The Negro listens to what he is told, not what he sees, not what he reads. And that's why you see that they are made to come to either church or mosque or synagogue every Friday or every Saturday or every Sunday so that the slave master can reinforce the lie. That's the only reason. Because there is no way you can tell us that the Most High eats money. Because they already complained that the Almighty, the people sacrificed to, they pour only the blood. But they still came back in their book to say that, oh, yeah, the man died. They killed the man and it was to shed the blood. So they don't understand it. But that's a different thing entirely. So to further confirm what we were saying, you see where it says, These proper fullers are however less numerous than the black fullers, who have sprung from the intermarriages of this tawny race with the Negroes. Do you need any further proof? Now, the so-called Indian Aboriginal wannabes, they will run away from these narratives and from the records because they understand that the moment you research it, all you will discover is that the dark Indians came from the intermingling of the Negro men and Negro women. That's how it was. Because at that time, they succeeded in proving to everybody that the Negroes were not human. So they were not even allowed to sleep with people of the opposite race. The men of those other races were allowed to sleep with Negro women, but not the other way around. And if a slave by law at that time had no father. So you need to conduct the research yourself. We want you to write it in the comment section that you have researched it and we lied. Not these, they are foot soldiers that don't understand what research means. We don't mean them. We mean genuine research on your own. And it goes further to say, this is the reason why fullers are sometimes mentioned in books on Africa as black men and at other times as red men. You saw something similar to what he was writing. But because he was a bit biased trying to defend his masters, that's why you see he said the Moors are like this and like that. But if you notice here, that description matches the Fulanese as well. But you see how they turn things around. One of their games is they introduce confusion. If you doubt what we're saying, if you're telling them something, all they will do is when they discover that you have caught them, because they are always afraid of the truth, they will make an accusation that is out of this world. So while you start defending yourself against that accusation, you lose track of what they are saying. That's their strategy. It doesn't change pattern. So you can come and tell them now, is it true that you stole this thing? Now, instead of answering you, they start telling you a story, telling you a story. Then they accuse you of one thing that they will say, maybe your forefather killed Jesus Christ. 
then you start asking how from there you get distracted totally that's how they operate they don't have any other styles other than introducing a level of confusion and then leverage on it to at least evade anything like saying we were guilty this is what we did wrong never i have also seen that when they say you hate them the moment you say did you do this or is this true what do you think about this you will hear oh you hate the fulani that's what you they will say they won't even tell you that oh we've read it or we've not and on the opposite side of the page you see where it says not long after the english occupation of jamaica a rebellion broke out in which the most dreadful atrocities were perpetrated by the maroons remember the maroons are usually a product of the slave master and the negro woman just like the mulattoes but for some reason they have different terms for different groups but that's by the way so it goes further to say the rebellion having been suppressed the inhabitants of the revolted district together with their chiefs were sent to nova scotia and subsequently in the year 1800 to sierra leone on the occasion of the disturbance among the settlers there so our interest is for you to see that the maroons were recognized at that time they saw that these maroons were behind the problem now remember the maroons because they were not pure negroes were considered like the mulattoes as having acquired the threats of being human from the wherever the cross is coming from that's whether from the european or the arab or from the fulanese or from the indian so you understand where these maroons and mulattoes come in but that's not our interest here so going further you see where it says let us see now who are the inhabitants of sierra leone they may be divided into two great classes colonists and liberated slaves note this very well the indian wannabes and aboriginal wannabes will not tell you this because they are paid and commissioned by the slave master to propagate those lies so it goes further to say the colonists are of five classes the settlers the maroons fullers and mandigos notice this it says colonists crewmen then europeans each of these classes must be considered separately so it starts with the settlers and it says the settlers are the descendants of the free blacks who before the outbreak of the american war of the last century had been the proprietors of cultivated land in the southern states of america those not our interest then on the right you see where it says maroons the word maroon is supposed to be a corruption of a spanish word signifying maruda or plunderer so you see how they labeled their product already as plunderer some however think that it is merely a mispronunciation of the word more note that very well whom the maroons resemble in complexion they had their origin in jamaica from an intermixture of several white and black races when during the early connection of the spaniards with that island runaway slaves not unfrequently secured their liberty in the impenetrable forest the maroon is by descent european american and african and he combines in his person the vices with very few of the virtues of these three races so we challenge the aboriginal wannabes the indian wannabes and the fulani foot soldiers to tell us where they are getting their own from at least we read it from here we didn't write it they wrote it then and going further let us now reference notes on nasarawa province nigeria and it was published 1910 and there we are shown that riches are very considerable as are also the agricultural though due to the depopulation caused by fulani slave raiders mainly in the 19th century only comparatively small areas are under cultivation now remember we showed you in the last video that they arrived there around the 13th century so but the slave master is obviously carefully just put in 19th century to add a level of doubt to when they arrived the area obviously also hide the fact that they were the moors so you see how the Sokoto Caliphate was established in 1802. Normally when they talk about the Caliphate, you will think it's only the Sokoto state you see in Nigeria. It extends all the way to Cameroon, to Ambazonia and to Biafra. So if you think it's just that north you're seeing, that's not correct. But look at what it says here. It says, at the beginning of the 19th century, Fulani herdsmen who had annually brought their herds 
to graze in the dry season as the rolling grass country of which the central portion of Nasrawa province consists were encouraged to settle by the fact that Fulani rule was rapidly spreading southwards. Now if you remember recently when they came with the Aruga, they claimed that they now want to settle, that they have not settled. That's the same thing. So if you think there is anything they are doing that they hadn't done in the past, it's a lie. Their treachery follows only one pattern. So whatever they did before, that's what they are going to do next because they are not very intelligent. So the slave master only gives them a code of what he wants. So they can only do that thing the slave master has said, not that they can come up with some better ways to do things. But let's move forward. It says, Fired by ambition, one Abudlahi, better known as Abduzango, a Katsina Fulani, persuaded a number of cattle owning Fulani like himself to bind themselves onto him and appointing one Imoru his Makama. He settled down circa AD 1802 and built a village with a heavy stockade rounded which gained it the name of Kefi, Kafi equal to Scotted of Barea. This stockaded town was later burnt and destroyed in a slave collecting razia by Zaria Fulani and the present town with its once strong triple wall and moat was built to replace it. It is believed that the ambitious Abduzanga attempted to obtain his title and a flag direct from Othman Danfodio emir of sokoto so remember if you remember in the parties in nigeria today this flag they still do it you see the parties they give flags to their candidates is significant of the fulani conquest but most people do not know because like we tell you the academic curriculum is controlled by the slave master through them so there are certain things they do not allow people to read or know there I'm going further it says this attempt was thus punished by zaria and Abduzanga was forced to become a vassal of Zaria, Malam Musa, first emir, who claimed that the emir of Sokoto had allotted to him the country down to the Benue to pay annual tributes in slaves and to hold his title direct from Zaria. Now remember, these tributes in slaves, slaves are human. So remember, this is where they, how they claimed that the Negroes were cattle, like beasts. So they could capture them, you keep them, you sit them down, wherever you keep them, they stay just like cattle. Remember that very well. That's how the slave master conditioned them. They have not risen above that till today. They still believe that the Negroes are beasts lower than cattle. If you doubt us, conduct your research. And going further, you see where it says, Founding of Jima, AD 1810, and it says, A little over a century ago, a malam of Kebi called Usman obtained leave to spread Islamism among the Fulani herdsmen who had settled east of Zaria. Remember, 1810, they said they arrived in 1810, but it said more than a century ago. This gives them away because like we told you, the Fulanis are likely the Moors, which if you conduct a research, you will see that they are. They are just hiding their identity. So it goes further to say, these Fulani were in Rugas, scattered about the Kachicheri Plateau, but had also their own farm villages inhabited by their Rondawa, pagan slaves. You know that very well, pagan slaves. These are the same people claiming they are the same with their Negroes. Malam Usman became their religious instructor as well as a secular advisor and appears to have formed them into a clan and ruled them jointly with their eldest member of one Abdul Rahman or whatever. But our interest is for you to ask any Nigerian around you what is Ruga and what, how the same Fulanis try to do this same thing they are doing here recently with the help of the BBC and the slave masters hiding behind them because the slave master likes to present the Negroes as evil animals and all that. So if the Fulani can put the Arugas everywhere he will go to his media and show the whole world that they see how they are. Knowing that the Fulanis are not the same as the Negroes, they are just acting as enemies within, which we shall continue to show you. And if you conduct your own research, monitor what they are doing there, follow Biafra and Ambazonia, you will understand it. So going further, you see how they learned to plant their foot soldiers all over the place that they want to conquer. Now remember, places like southern Nigeria, like the east or southwest or south-south, the governors there are just Fulani foot soldiers. Whether they have Fulani blood or not is a different thing. For some reason, we may not be able to explain how the people are so subservient, 
perhaps because of the type of terror the Fulani come with. Even for ordinary lawyers, they will invade your court, they are very lawless. So you see what it says. When the Kajuru inhabiting the Kachicheri plateau became restless and massed together to oppose the advancing Fulani invasion, which had been then reached Zaria and overthrown the Habem dynasty, Malam Osman appears to have been watching events. As a commencement, the Kajuru determined to wipe out the community of Fulani headsmen and a plot was formed to set on them unawares to kill them all and to appropriate all their cattle and slaves. This plot was revealed to the Fulani by Indem, the Fulani favorite of the Sari king Kajuru, who had confided the plot to her. The Fulani thus forewarned got away in the night and the Kajuru on attacking found only the aged and infirm and a few young calves which could not travel fast. They followed the Fulani to the edge of the Kagaru Plateau and managed to cut off a few, but were eventually driven off. The main body of the Fulani escaped and settled on the spurs of the Daroro Hills. So you see how they are. They are cowardly. So that's why if you have any meeting, let's say the Southeast and South-South in what is Nigeria, they concocted a South-South geopolitical zone when you know there is no cardinal point called South-South. There were obviously lots of what to call them. If you come together, they are very cowardly. They will come and strike terror into one or two of you just to prevent that coming together because that's who the Fulanese are. But the slave master hides behind them. Remember, the slave master is stealing the resources. So the Fulani, their own duty is to keep the place in turmoil while the slave master continues to steal the resources in those areas. That's all they are doing, nothing more. He, they understand that all the Fulani need from them are European goods and weapons. That's all. So here we see the arrival of the British Protectorate, which was established around then. But our interest is for you to see how they handled the area at that time. And it says, a rough method of tax collection was the demanding of about one-tenth of crops, live stock, and even of children of the pagans. Remember, that's how they got the slaves. You have to give everything the slave master demanded. If you notice this one-tenth, that's how they got the titan system. The thing you have in your Bible, they tell you titan. The Fulanese used to collect tithes in slaves, which if you doubt, you're going to see shortly yourself. But our interest is for you to see the whole thing when the British came and how they were. It was the Fulanese everywhere. And if you notice just on top where it says, These sub emirates may be considered as having originally been advanced bases for purposes of slave raiding. With the rapid depopulation of the country, feeble attempts were made to administer it. And each emirate was parceled out in lots which were given to the various office holders who in turn divided the various villages among their retainers who became jegadu or tax collectors. So that's the same thing they create. That's why they have the governors and all those states you have in what is Nigeria today and in Cameroon, in provinces or areas, whatever they create, that is the philosophy behind it. Now remember, when you look at the area with the same mindset like the US having states and Nigeria having states, you have not studied the history well. When you study the history, you understand that the symmetry is not the same, but the philosophy behind slavery for the area was the same. And in the event you think that there is anything we are talking about here that you can verify or that they don't know. Now, remember we told you one thing about their foot soldiers is that they lack intelligence, they lack basic common sense, and they lack humanity. They can murder any number of people they don't care there is nothing on earth that you make them feel anything called human pity they don't have it that should prove to you that they were the slave hunters of old even at that time it was extremely difficult to stop them from slave hunting and slave raiding but you see how with the help of the slave master they were able to blame the victims for their atrocities now let us show you a little example of what we mean Look at the URL on your screen and see if you can navigate to it on your browser. If you could, then you will read this history of the so-called Nigerian Army today, which was a Fulani and Islamic slave-hunting militia renamed Nigerian Army in 1863. Our interest is to show you that it is likely they were the Moors. So we see that the history of the Nigerian Army dates 
1863. Note this very well. This is their official website and official records. Our interest is to show you how they lie brazenly. They lie in such a way that they make a mockery of the truth. Then when you come up with the truth to the Negroes because they listen to what they are told, not the facts, not the truth, then you will look like or sound like a broken record. Or a conspiracy theorist. Now, if you look at the case of something like indigenous people of Biafra, you will notice that while the people were saying, okay, build our schools, allow the businesses to thrive, they labeled them hate speech, labeled them terrorists, labeled them everything because they still believe that the Negro is a slave and that they believe whatever they are told. Now, tell us what has independence or freedom or building schools and roads got to do with terrorism but you see how their brains work that's what the slave master tells them to do so if you were to study what we're telling you you can do your own research yourself look for a fulani or any of their foot soldiers now remember a conditioned negro will defend them as well so if you look for any of them and ask them questions like okay what was the crime of the ipob why did they why were they declared terrorists you will see what they will blab then of course the slave master will hide behind them and probably get them to go and bomb somewhere or kill some people and tell the world that it was done by this group that's all they do they don't have any other pattern and we shall show you how the slave master wrote their intelligence in a positive way here you will understand it but you see they told you that the army was allegedly established or formed in 1863 by lieutenant glover of the royal navy now remember the royal navy forming the army and that he selected 18 indigenous from the northern part of the country 18 indigenous know this very well how their lives work and organized them into a local force known as the glover houses note is 18 indigenous so they just assumed they are all houses the small force was used by glover as governor of lagos to mount punitive expeditions in the lagos hinterland and to protect British trade routes around Lagos. In 1865, the Glover Hausa became a regular force with the name Hausa Constabulary. It performed both police and military duties for the Lagos colonial government. It later became Lagos Constabulary. Now, we don't want to read all that. You can read it yourself, but going further down, you see where it says, on incorporation into West African Frontier Force in 1901, it became Lagos Battalion. In addition to this force, the British government included the Royal Niger Company Constabulary Force in Northern Nigeria in 1886 and the Oyo Rivers Irregular in 1891. In 1889, Lord Frederick Lugard had formed the incipient body of what was to be known in 1890 as the West African Frontier Force. So you see, the West African Frontier Force was formed in 1890. Then this same army now called Nigerian Army was joined into it by 1901. Note this very well. Look at their contradictions. Like we told you, the foot soldiers, they lack basic common sense and they lack humanity. They can lie more than Satan and you will see it clearly. You will understand it too if you were to conduct the research yourself. You can at least see that the army existed as at 1863. Then, the West African Frontier Force was formed in 1889, according to them too, before it was now joined by the Nigerian Army in 1901. So that should tell you, by that time in 1863 that they formed it, what were they doing before West African Frontier Force came? What was the West African Frontier Force? At least you can see that they were both different. Ask yourself this basic question. And by then, to the average Nigerian, Nigeria hadn't been created until 1914. Just bear that in mind, even though Nigeria existed before that time very well too. But because the slave master is always hiding identities to perpetuate his evil, that's how he claims that this is how these things were formed. Now remember, all they are hiding is the fact that these Fulanese were the Moors. So they are continuing with their slave raiding and slave hunting. You might doubt us, but conduct the research. Notice also where he claims that with the amalgamation of Nigeria in 1914, the unification of the northern and southern regiments came into being and this witnessed the birth of the Nigerian regiments. Note this very well because we are going to show you that they are liars right here. 
the Northern Nigerian Regiments became the first and second battalions of the Nigerian Regiment, while the Southern Nigerian Regiments became the third and fourth battalions of the Nigerian Regiments. Now remember, there were no armies in the South because those people were defending themselves against the slave hunters, which were the Europeans. So there was no way they could have had an army and they were still being captured. So there was no army in the south and if you look at their accounts and all the rubbish they are writing here, you will see that he never mentioned when the armies in the south were formed. All you will hear is that so so and so, all you reverse constabulary or all those nonsense were now brought in. Meanwhile, as at that time the slave master hadn't come to physically stay in the area. They were not even allowed because at that time the Negroes saw the slave master for who he was and didn't want him around them. It was by conquest that they came and established their churches and schools. And going forward, you see that when in 2013, they celebrated 150 years. So you understand how they lie. They are not people that lie and then you identify the lie and they say, okay, we apologize, that's okay. If you see their lie, they kill you. Or you believe that it's not a lie or you have to join them and continue propagating the lie. So when the truth comes out, everybody will say, oh, it's conspiracy. So now you see that in 2013, after they celebrated their 150 years, sensible people started asking questions. How come the army is older than the country? Remember this, we are the slave hunters. So that's how the slave master played smart. So he gathers a bunch of fools, uses them to capture the Negroes, and then turn around to say the Negroes were selling themselves. And of course, the world believes today that Africans sold other Africans. You see them so-called African-Americans, those that believe in the out of Africa theory like they now call it because the slave master knows how to condition the Negro. They believe that their forefathers were so stupid to have sold their siblings, their children and all those, which we know is a very big lie. It was done by these Moors. They renamed them Fulanis and Babas or whatever thing they chose and Arabs and then still used them to capture the Negroes, which we shall continue to show you. So as soon as these questions came up, guess what the Nigerian army did? They now went and redesigned their websites and hid this path. So you can go and look at the website and see if you will find it there. Their history is no longer there. Unless they can watch this and then put it back. Because they like to tell lies by force. They impose their lies on you even when it doesn't make sense. That's how they make all of us look stupid all over the world. From the book we referenced earlier, you see what it tells us here. It says in March 1903, the emails of Lafia and Jema made formal submission. In April 1904, the administration of Abuja Division was commenced and an assistant resident was posted there with a company of the West African Frontier Force to protect him. Now we ask you, didn't the army tell us that the army joined the West African Frontier Force and formed the regiment, Nigerian Lagos Constabulary Regiment or whatever claims they made? before then. So how come it is the same West African Frontier Force that the Nigerian army had become, whatever Lagos Constabulary or whatever he called it or they lie about it, that is still the one coming to protect somebody by 1903. Note this important point very well. Please notice that it says it became in 1901 on incorporation as West African Frontier Force, it became Lagos Battalion. So ideally, if you read that book again very well, you see that what they are now telling us that the army that came there is not just West African Frontier Force anymore, but Lagos Battalion that came to protect the man. But let's leave that. You will understand why we are telling you all this. These are liars. They were the slave hunters. But you see how the slave master, using his foot soldiers, glorified the army. If you doubt anyone in Nigeria today, you will see some people trying to join the army. They don't even remember again that the army is just uniform murderers. They're just brutal murderers. That's all they do. There is nothing useful you can say the army does in that sub-region. They just kill people. They were the slave hunters at that time. They just dressed them on borrowed robes. So that's why you see that despite the slave trade supposedly ending in 1863 or whenever, the place is still not making any progress. But you think they had ended. They hadn't. So let's just move forward. And to portray the fact that they are liars and they were the slave hunters, you see the lies very clearly. Let us reference the Nigeria Handbook containing statistical and general information respecting the colony and protectorate compiled by A.C. Bonds of the Chief Secretary's Office, Lagos, fourth issue, and it was published in 1922 
and there we are shown that in 1866, the colony became a portion of the West African settlements under a governor-in-chief resident at Sierra Leone and in 1874, it was united with the Gold Coast colony, note this very well, that is about Lagos. And in 1886, Lagos and its hinterland, which had been gradually acquired, was separated from the Gold Coast and became the colony and protectorate of Lagos. Now, if the Nigerian army, or so-called Nigerian army, was formed in 1863 when Glover took some houses to Lagos, and Lagos at that time did not even exist as a colony or part of Nigeria, how can you say that Nigerian army was created by that group? Understand this very well. Lagos was part of the Gold Coast. So why is it not the Ghanaian army? Now remember, the Ghanaian army itself came from the West African Frontier Force which is actually the genuine path. Also, notice that these people came from Sierra Leone because that's where they resettled, they freed the Negroes, resettled the slaves, came and camped there and started operating from there and coming downwards. So, going further, you see that in 1906, Lagos and Southern Nigeria were amalgamated and designated the colony and protectorate of Southern Nigeria the old colony and protectorate of Lagos becoming the western province while the remainder of the country was divided into the country and eastern provinces. Now remember very well too that Lagos was not part of Nigeria and was not amalgamated with southern Nigeria until 1906 and that in 1906 that southern Nigeria it only became southwest but you see how they have expanded it and coming down towards Benin because they, are, they play smart. Remember we mentioned to you that the like they was are Negroes, but these other people are Dahomians. So they use them when they tell you Yoruba, they created that thing which you can study and it includes the Fulanese and they are the Moors. So that's why they keep coming. There is nothing you can say or do that will make you coexist with them in peace. Never. So here you see that it tells us that the Oyu Rivers Protectorate, which was officially recognized after the Berlin Conference in 1885, please compare these dates with what the Allying Army wrote on their website so you understand that they were the slave hunters and they belonged to the Moors who are now called Fulanese. Bear this in mind. And it goes further to say, lay to the eastward of the Lagos territories. It was governed at first by consuls and in 1891, a commissioner and consul general was appointed resident at Calabar with deputy. In 1893, the hinterland was annexed. See how the conquest was working so you understand that the Moors are just the caretakers to the slave master's conquest. And it goes further to say, and now increased territory was renamed the Niger Coast Protectorate and placed under an imperial commissioner and consul general. In 1894, after severe fighting, the Chekiri chief Nana, who had practically stopped all trade on the lower parts of the Benin River, was defeated and deported. Note this very well. In 1897, a peaceful mission to Benin was treacherously attacked and all but two of the European members of the mission were massacred. A powerful expedition captured the city and the king surrendered and was deported. In 1900, the Niger Coast Protectorate, which had been under foreign office control, was constituted the Protectorate of Southern Nigeria and placed under the High Commissioner responsible to the Colonial Office. Two years later, that's 1902, an expedition subjugated and disarmed the Aro tribe which held paramount power over a large territory between the Niger and Cross rivers. Now remember very well, you notice it says it disarmed the Aro tribe. The Aro were priests. Now when we look at the Bible itself and how they came up with some of the things they wrote there, you will understand what we're saying. So you see how they claim that they disarmed them. It is from this little note here. That the slave masters foot soldiers now concocted that the army the priests had those that were reading for slaves for them now remember this was the way of life of the people they forbade things like killing people stealing uh, taking another person's wives those were the main things that carried capital offense under the so-called pagan system of the negroes which was the true worship of the almighty creator of heaven and earth before they came with their lives they put in a book 
So you see where it says it disarmed them. Also notice that the Nanaya of Ishekiri, he claimed he had fought them after a heavy fight and all that. If you want to understand how these lies work, look at the Nigerian police, which is a Fulani, the Moors we believe they are, raided the lawyer's house. And if you look at how the press reported it, they reported it that when they got there, as soon as they got there, some people suspected to be indigenous people of Biafra members were shooting, started shooting at the police. They burnt the man's house down and started shooting at the police and killed two policemen. That's how their lives work. This is what the slave master taught them to do. So that's what they are doing. Now notice, it is only a madman that will see police people just coming and then you start shooting them. And then suddenly they burnt the whole place down. That's how who they are. It doesn't change. This is what the slave master taught them. Now, if you look at these things, he said they, they defeated the Nana who stopped trade. See, he stopped trade on some parts of the lower Benin and then deported him. Now, where was his army? He had no army. All these people were running away from slave raids at that time. They feared the slave hunters. And you notice very well too that the Benin, they they claim that they were going on a peaceful mission to Benin but were treacherously attacked and all but two of the European members of the mission were massacred. You can look at the Benin massacre. At least you see what they wrote. Apply your common sense. You will see that there is no way it could have just been that they were coming peacefully. They were coming with soldiers. If somebody is coming to you with soldiers, at that time that they knew that the soldiers were the slave hunters, what did they expect? So the Benin's obviously defended themselves because based on what happened to the chief of the Nana of Ishekiri. Now remember, all these names they concocted, all these people were just Negroes. So the Ishekiri, Ejo, all those things were names concocted by the slave masters. The same way the Nigerian state today gives people an identity of Southeast, Niger Delta, Southwest, South South was how these names were concocted. They just look for a group because they had different names everywhere. They give them a name. That's who they were. But let's just move forward. So you notice that this Aro tribe that is mentioned here where it says two years later an expedition subjugated and disarmed the Aro tribe which held paramount power over a large territory between the Niger and the Cross Rivers. They were a bunch of priests. The people were a theocracy at that time. That is the rule by the Most High. That's how they were ruled before the slave master came and gave them the golden calf of Christianity or Islam today. But then... That's the same one the man that made the comment claimed that they were the slave hunters at that time. We shall show you a little bit of what games they played. You will see it is well documented but like we told you he is here to defend his masters. So we are going to show you what he's talking about. But please notice that all that he wrote were things they concocted. They are very good at concocting lies. You see how they concocted that police came and as soon as they got there some so-called IPOB members started shooting at them, they burnt the house. That's who they are. If they want to attack you now, they will just come and attack you, do kill you, and then start their lies. So you see how they murdered the priests and now claim that they were behind the slave raids. Now, please bear this in mind. You see how it says an Arab tribe that they held paramount powers. It didn't say they were raiding for slaves. It just gave them the powers because they felt that without these, their religion, which was they were struggling to introduce at that time, we can show you on a different video, wouldn't be able to grow. And at the same time, they needed to deceive people that it was the Negroes selling themselves because they were closing the slave trade at this time. They effectively succeeded around 1900-1901. Let us reference the making of Northern Nigeria by Captain C.W.J. Orr and it was published 1911. And here we see how they destroyed the arrow. Please remember that the arrow were just like the Levitical priests. That's just what you need to bear in mind. That's just who they were. Nothing like war or anything like that. So it says, In the spring of 1901, Sir Frederick Lugard proceeded home on leave of absence. Mr. William Wallace, assuming administrative charge of the protectorate until his return in the autumn, the same year, a second contingent of troops, between 600 and 700 strong, note the number of troops, was sent from the protectorate to the Ashanti War, leaving in April and returning in October. In the later month, a contingent, 300 strong, was further sent to southern Nigeria 
to assist in an expedition against the Aro tribes in that protectorate, this being the third occasion within two years on which northern Nigeria was called upon to provide a contingent for operations outside the protectorate. Now remember, they were telling you that this army was the Nigerian army. The same army is now working with the slave masters and fighting other people because the slave master knows how to use your people against you. So they will normally come and permeate and put enemies within, which is the same thing you see them doing. They claim that the army was in 1863 and all that. These were the slave hunters. That's why they came to kill the arrow and claim that they were behind the slave trade. Going further, you can read on top of the highlighted portion to understand the context. But it says, the abolition of slave raiding. Note this very well. There is nothing selling about all this. It was a military expedition and it is the Nigerian army you see there today. They were the slave hunters. That's where they came from. No doubt about it. So you see where it goes on to say, and intertribal warfare was therefore the first duty that devolved on the new administration. But this meant nothing more than or less than a military occupation of the entire country. For it was idle to suppose that peace could be achieved from a distance by a mere decree without a force on the spot strong enough to impose it. Nothing but fierce opposition to a policy which prohibited slave raiding could be expected from the Mohammedan states whose entire social organization depended on a sufficient supply of slaves and whose so-called wars provided them with their main source of income. Now, they are telling you that these people that they have been described here, that's the Muslims of the north, are not the slave hunters. It is the southerners that they were capturing as slaves. So you see the thing. That's how you notice that their food soldiers lack the most basic of humanity and common sense. They are not people that they can kill your parents and you complain and they say, oh, it was a mistake. They would rather kill you than accept that mistake. And that's the full and understanding of conquest or being superior. Killing people, that's all they know. If you check anywhere, you won't see anything you say they have invented unless the slave master after listening to this will go and create one inventor for them. See what the Emir had to say. You see the same way they fight over Biafra today with the slave master hiding behind them and helping them because the slave master is stealing the resources. He knows that his food soldiers lack basic humanity and common sense. You can't even shout for job and they say, oh, okay, these are our siblings. Let's create jobs for them. No they will rather label you a terrorist and start killing you and you think it's a joke that's who they are it's not for us to tell you it's for you to research it yourself watch what is going on in Biafra and Ambazonia because it's the same place controlled by the same Fulani Caliphate in Sokoto so you don't think there is anything we are saying here that you can't investigate or verify yourself so all these comments that you see coming from them you will even see from their comments that they lack content, they lack context. They just keep trying to make claims, concoct lies, believing that people will believe them. That's all. They are masters in Islamic takia. Now, if you notice, if you in the Americas believe that your forefathers were so daft and stupid to have sold you, even when the books are saying something totally different, that should tell you how powerful their takia and propaganda are. While noting that slave hunting and slave raiding was their source of income, note the same people that tell you today that Islam doesn't support slavery or slave trade. Then you see what they may have said when they were asked to stop it. Meanwhile, today they are telling us that it was the priests that there was no such record about. So you understand where the whole thing is coming from. And it says, can a cat give up mousing? This is a response to stopping slave hunting. Oh, this is an emir supposedly a muslim because like we told you the fulanese were the moors they obviously renamed them so you wouldn't know who they are can a cat give up mousing was the reply of the slave raiding emir of contagora when informed that under the british regime slave raiding must cease when i die it will be with a slave in my mouth the pagan tribes might be expected to welcome a power which promised them their immunity from the slave raids which had devastated their countries for centuries note this very well you see where it gives away when the Fulanese arrived you know, remember they have been telling you that they arrived in the 19th century but it's telling them that they have been devastated by the slave raids for centuries 
there he gives it away. Remember the slave master is smart and works assiduously to protect his food soldiers because he benefits from their lack of common sense and um, humanity. So you see how they gave it away here by saying that the slave raids which had devastated their countries for centuries. That alone should tell you that there's no way they could have come in the 19th century. And this book was being written in 1905 or 1910 rather. And they are talking about slave raids for centuries. So you understand what the game is all about here. So going further it says, as events turned out moreover, these pagan tribes proved even more troublesome than the Mohammedan states. For their suspicion of the new conquering power were difficult to remove. And for reasons which will presently be given, they did not appreciate the new anti-slavery policy as warmly as might have been expected. Now, at that time, what they knew was that it was the Europeans, which will be the same shape and form like the Moors, like the Fulanese, that were doing the slave hunts. So, why should they trust them when they had seen the worst of it? So, this is easy for you to see at least. So, how come it is now the arrows that supposedly sold the slaves so you notice that one of their foot soldiers has been all over the place on this channel claiming that a bogus name he concocted from nowhere were the slave hunters in the south which is a lie which you can easily see from here the so-called pagans were moving down south but they were stopped by the ocean it is because they have no further place to move to that's why you see this biafra agitation and of course the moors now called fulanese find a rescues in their so-called global warming and they are bringing their cattle southward that's just what is happening which we shall continue to show you and which the events there will continue to prove to you if you are the type that have the most basic of humanity and common sense to be able to look at things analytically not listening to what the slave hunters are saying like the nigerian army or the cameroonian army or their government or the bbc or voa or Al Jazeera. those people are working together which will guarantee you if you conduct most basic research you will understand what they are doing please without losing sight of the book we are looking at let us quickly reference a tropical dependency an outline of the ancient history of the western sudan by flora elshaw and it was published 1905 and there we see the same group saying the slave trade should not be stopped and it says the position of the Fulani chiefs was, however, in the first instance profoundly modified by a condition which was of the very essence of British administration. A large part of their revenue had consisted of tribute paid in slaves and in some cases of the tithe levied on the produce of slave rates. See where they got their tithes from all those things you talk about tithes and taxation. You need to research them and how they were introduced, be it in the church or mosque or synagogue, whatever one you go to, just research them. So it goes further to tell us that a large part of their revenue had consisted of tribute paid in slaves and in some cases of the tithe levied on the produce of slave raids which they conducted either in person or by the medium of the commander of their troops but under british government the slave raid and the slave trade was abolished and all dealing in slaves became illegal it was not made illegal for a native to own slaves but by the abolition of the legal status of slavery every slave who chose to do so could assert his freedom while the decree making all children free who were born in the protectorate after april 1 1901 was a decree of general emancipation of the coming generation now that's the same thing that the indian and aboriginal one of are telling you that it didn't happen or that one thing or the other they are aboriginal there so if we showed you the exports from what was negro land and guinea and then somebody is telling you they are aboriginal such a person should also tell us where these exports went to they will tell us they went to jamaica then you check the population of jamaica tell us they went to haiti you check the population of haiti tell us they went to brazil you check the population of brazil then they claim they were aboriginal to the united states whereas as of that time the united states did not exist as a country it was just a collection of colonies and slave masters plantations so you see how unfortunate these aboriginal and indian wannabes are with their bogus claims so going further you see where it says 
the fact has to be faced by the administrator in Mohammedan Africa, that's Islamic Africa, that the abolition of slavery is not a straightforward task of beneficence. It carries with it grave and undeniable disadvantages to the slaves as well as to the arm owners and the objections urged against it by the local rulers and employers are not by any means without foundation. So now you see that the same Fulani chiefs didn't want the slave trade to end, but they want you to, to believe today that the Negroes were selling themselves and that they are Negroes too. So you see how some of them came here to leave comments that they were also in the US. How did they get there? Those are all engineered. Like we told you, the slave masters, food soldiers, they lack both common sense and humanity. So you see how they are all claiming to have been victims as well. Meanwhile, they never tell you who it was that sold them. Look at this comment from one of them. You can read it yourself and it says, It seems like you are trying to divide the people. Let me tell you something. I am a Fulani from Sierra Leone. It seems like you have some hatred towards Fulani people. You forgot that there are Fulanis everywhere in Africa, not just in Nigeria. So pick your battle wisely and stop deceiving the people based upon your own self-hate and ideology. This is personal to you. You are part of Biafra. So you notice he couldn't even spell Biafra. The fake country wannabe. Get ready to fight the whole of Africa, even if we have much in Nigeria with reinforcements. So you see who they are. You see this little thing that somebody would have started using his brain for. They want to fight. That's all they are because the slave master discovered this. You notice that he is talking about Biafra. He says people want you want to divide people. They feel they are united in a place where ordinary, to build road, road, they can't build. To build school, they can't. Even to have proper curriculum to teach children the good right thing, they can't. The slave master just hides behind them, smuggle very ugly things into the academic curriculum so that the children get conditioned from childhood. So you see something like this outside family, outside wife rubbish that they put there. You might think that's who the people are. But remember, if a child grows up with such rubbish in his mind, he has already been conditioned that way. Then when he starts living that way, the woman will start fighting and saying, Oh, my husband is unfaithful. My husband is this. Without knowing that this is what they were taught as children. You see how he comes in. That's who the slave master is. And he uses these people to make all of us look foolish. So for the so-called African-Americans that you think we are all Africans, look at them. He probably didn't see where it was also recorded that the Fulanis do not allow the Negroes marry their own wives, their own women. He wouldn't see that. That's who they are. You see further down where he wrote, get ready to fight the whole of Africa because they are in each and every country in Africa. You are making a big mistake by trying to divide our African brothers and sisters. You see that they have no shame. These are the same people that will go and kill people. Somebody will kill your father, kill your mother, kill your siblings, steal them, sell them as slaves, do all kinds of things and still open his mouth to tell you that you are his brother. It does it make sense to you? That should tell you who they are. That's why the slave master is able to use them. Now look at how they have used them to steal all the resources, you know, all the oil. When you talk about Nigeria exporting oil and all that, it's coming from one region, one source, one area. Then the slave master uses these Fulanese to make sure that nothing threatens it. But you see them talking about brother and sister. Meanwhile, it's not like they are putting anything back in that society. They make sure the place is so underdeveloped that you will consider whoever lives there an animal if you doubt what we're saying look at some schools that are there that's schools that all you need to build them is less than let's say five hundred dollars but you can never be allowed to build them now if you they don't allow you to build them the slave master uses them to show that you, the negro is incapable of development whereas from all indications these were the malls that he's planted as enemies within you see how they went to invade the lawyer's house burnt the place now presented a picture of two policemen they killed and burnt the truck and say oh the people killed them and of course they went to the media which we know pointed a gun on their head as they would do you can see from this comment alone you should know how the person is to say right that when the police got there some people suspected to be indigenous of people of biafra members started shooting at the police they think the negroes are as foolish as themselves so why will anybody sensible or not just see police and start shooting so you see how they are when they concoct those lies 
to anyone that knows they make all of us look foolish but to their foot soldiers they are smart and that's what the slave master leverages on they lack both humanity and common sense let's go back to the book we were looking at previously but here is a, a screenshot or image of what looks like a slave landing that is when they brought slaves fresh from negro land and guinea so you see that the so-called um, aborigine and indian wannabes may actually be fulanese like the moors they have been conditioned to start telling the lies because when people tell lies that are so unintelligent so stupid you should know that there must be something wrong with their thinking faculties now if you look at young Pharaoh, for example that's a typically how the slave master operates he comes in as if he's a friend he comes in with some things that look like what you would like to hear then that's a precursor to when he will get to his destination you see how after a very long time building the group and all that he has now come to claim that the indians are the same as the negroes and you notice that it is the same with what Dan Calloway is saying. And everyone, almost everyone now knows that Dan Calloway is a controlled individual working for the slave masters. So you see how the young fellow has come into, into it. That's who they are. He's going to start producing many videos and different from that subject for a while to let that lie sink in. So that when people would have forgotten, he will come in again to start making the claim. You know, in Dan Calloway's case, he came in and started pretending to be working for the Negroes then African Americans and then started debunking everything many people realized he was lying so if you watch this video on YouTube you will see where somebody who realized late who the young Pharaoh was was also apologizing for endorsing him initially but that's how the slave master comes in he comes in with initially what looks like the truth then everybody gathers around it then he will come out with the original lie he was planning to propagate that's who they are it doesn't change if you looked closely at the slave hunters or whoever they were or the captains of the ship or whatever you will see that they are likely the moors so we're gonna go further to see that the fulanese are actually the moors renamed and they are still wrecking the havoc all over the sub-region with the protection of the slave master and their media tells us here from the same book we've been referencing that's the making of northern nigeria it will be remembered that Bida and also Contagora were provinces of the empire of Sokoto, note this very well, in which a partly pagan and wholly indigenous population was ruled by a Mohammedan emirs of an alien race, the Fulani. Note this very well, at least they have confirmed that the Fulanis are alien to the area. It has been seen that in many cases, pagan people had petitioned to be freed from their Fulani oppressors and had appeared delighted at the letters of a true. It may be wondered why under such circumstances, the policy was not adopted of removing the Fulanese from their governing positions and appointing instead chiefs from the people themselves. The answer is that it was considered that the Fulani race was possessed of such a genius for rule and so much intelligence that their continence in positions of responsibility was best for the people provided that their power for evil were held in check as in fact was assured by the appointment of a resident with an adequate force behind him so you see how they are playing with people's lives they are saying that even as the Fulanese do whatever they do they are possessed of great genius to rule now tell us what you are seeing in that place does it look like a place that a genius even lives in let alone a genius rule no the question or the answer is the fact that their lack of common sense and humanity plays into the slave master's hands and the slave master enjoys using them imagine where you go and carry oil as much as you want and then you have a fool a bunch of fools called army who were the slave hunters to help you maintain the flow of that oil that's you are stealing from a people and you have somebody within them as an enemy within that opens the door for you to come and steal whenever you want that's what the slave master is leveraging on otherwise could you please explain to us what genius could be doing in the same page with the same group that are massacring innocent people they can't even play up lies that make sense you saw how they went to invade the lawyer's house and all they did was to run to the whole press to write that as soon as the police got near people started shooting at them 
Now think about it. Now they went and declared the lawyer wanted, burnt down his house. That's who they are. The slave hunters and the slave masters foot soldiers. They lack both humanity and common sense, which we challenge you to prove us wrong or prove the books wrong anyway. Also, notice that the slave master is afraid of them because he goes further to say that to conserve the existing machinery, to preserve all that was best in it and patiently to eliminate all its evils and abuses was in short the aim in view. It was frankly an experiment. As Sir Frederick Lugard stated in his first report, I am anxious, he wrote, to prove to these people in bracket the Fulanese that we have no hostility to them and only to insist on good government and justice and I am anxious to utilize, if possible, their wonderful intelligence for they are born rulers and incomparably above the negroid races in ability. Now tell us if that place looks like somewhere ruled by any sensible person on earth, if we may ask. So you see that the slave master understands what he wants. It is never by the generosity of the baker that we have bread. He is also mindful of his own interests. That's why the slave master is always behind them. Notice that it's been proven that they do a lot of evil. But you see how they said they wouldn't remove them from positions of authority because they were considered to be geniuses in ruling. What nonsense can that be? Think about it. They were the malls, anyways. But going further, and now look out for the link between them and the malls. After the death of this king, the greatness of Bonu began to wane and steadily declined till at the beginning of the 19th century. The then much reduced empire found a difficulty in holding its own against the fuller empire of Sokoto. Note this very well which was at that time rising on its western borders at this juncture when the once powerful kingdom was on the point of being brought under a foreign yoke. There arose a stranger, a nationalized Arab, who is saving the last remains of the kingdom, founded a new dynasty. This remarkable man named Alamin Ben Mohammed El Kanemi was born in Fezan of Kanem parents though on his father's side descended from a moor so you see where the link is coming from because now at that time they needed to probably explain to everyone who the moors were and who this new breed of so-called fulanese would be so that's probably why they have a link it is that link that will prove it beyond any reasonable doubts that they just remodeled remember the reason they do the remodeling is so that you can't think back in time if you notice the Indian and Aboriginal wannabe, if they successfully sell that dummy that the Negroes are now Indian, it effectively wipes off the slave trade, removes their history and makes them only exist to about let's say 1900 or thereabout. Because if you notice, the slave trade only ended in 1863 following the Emancipation Proclamation of Lincoln. But you see how the slave master started saying, oh Lincoln didn't free anybody through his foot soldiers anyways so now if he succeeds in getting them to now say oh you are now indian you notice that some gullible ones have started propagating it to the kids that's how it gets changed so obviously they change the moors to the fulanese or arabs or whatever names they chose then they change these things like the mohammedans to islam because if you look at it very well it is the same thing there is no use in changing the name if the person is still the same person he was they were still the slave hunters, they helped to subjugate and enslave the Negroes, they called the Negroes pagans. So whether you change their name to Mohammedanism or Islam or Muslim, they are still the same thing. The philosophy has not changed. And going further, it says, After visiting Egypt, he came to Canem and soon earned for himself the extreme correctness of his life and the benevolence of his disposition, the respect and affection of the people. Conceiving the design of freeing Bornu from the invaders, he collected a following and in a series of well-planned and courageously executed campaigns, drove the Fulas from the country. Now if you looked at it very well, you will think that, oh okay, the Moors will be different because they drove the Fulas or allegedly drove the Fulas. You need to connect the dots, which we are going to do shortly, but then going further, it says, Raising the green flag, the standard of the prophet. You see how people are murdering others and calling it the standard of their prophet. In other people's land, though, these are invaders. They are not indigenous to the area. 
So when you see those people in the so-called African Americans telling you, oh, our forefathers sold their siblings, you know that they have been conditioned with this superlative level of ignorance. And they don't know what they are talking about. So it goes further to say, he refused all titles but that of servant of God. We need to ask ourselves which God these people are talking about. Is it the same God that said thou shalt not kill or a different God? Certainly it is not the almighty creator of heaven and earth. We can all see that very clearly. So it goes further to say and proceeded to clear the whole country of the invaders and to reward the faithful followers who had assisted him. The Sultan remained a figurehead, the whole of the real power resting in the hands of the Sheikh, who assumed, in fact, the position of a dictator. So you see how they turned someone else's ancestral home into a war field, into a field of blood, and then turn around to blame them for being unable to develop. So you see who the slave master and their full soldiers are. These are obviously the Moors. At least we have seen here that this one has a Moorish father. And that takes us to the next account. The story of the black empires of the West is one of great interest, but it has no place here. This is what the author is saying. Its early chroniclers were Moors. Bear this important point in mind, and with the expulsion of that race from Spain in the 16th century, their writings were lost for the time being to Europe. Remembering the struggle which took place at that period between the Mohammedan folks and the Christian races, the discovery of the New World and the opening of, up of China and India to trade, and the constant turmoil in Europe itself, it is small wonder that the inhabitants of the fertile land which lay beyond the desert were left unmolested and forgotten by the northern races. Indeed, the expulsion of the Moors from Spain caused indirectly the almost complete cessation of the intercourse which had been kept up for over 500 years between the inhabitants of the countries south of the desert and the Arab Baba population of the Mediterranean coast. Bear this important point in mind. For the Moors, driven from Europe into Morocco, attacked and broke up the highly civilized black empire which had established itself in the interior and becoming themselves decadent, lapsed into semi-barbarism and adopted a life of nomadic robbery. After this, for over 200 years, Negro land was cut off from all communication with Europe, isolated from the outside world as before by the desert to the north and the trackless forest to the south. It remained for Europeans in the 19th century to rediscover a country inhabited by races, possessing a high degree of civilization, acquainted through their Mohammedan religion with literature, history, jurisprudence, and the art of government, and endowed with many of the qualities which go to make a people fit to take their place amongst the nations of the world. Our interest is for you to see the Moors. We shall look at the other things in a subsequent video, but the important thing is for you to know that those you call Fulanis today were the Moors, and the slave master uses them to make all of us in that sub-region look foolish. That's why they put them in almost all the countries in West Africa, they are ruled by them. So you see that when one is messing up, the others keep quiet, but the slave master will go to his place and teach the children, the so-called African Americans, the blacks in Europe, Asia and everywhere, how their people are so incorrigible cannot develop useless and all that so you see who they are using our interest is for you to say it don't listen to these comments from their food soldiers you can obviously see that they lack both research input and commonsensical content Plus, also reference letters and sketches from northern nigeria by martin s kish and it was published 1910 and there we are shown that the supremacy of malay lasted till the middle of the 14th century when Songhai, a subject kingdom of ancient origin, asserted its independence. From this time, Songhai steadily increased in power and formed a great empire in the Western Sudan. Now remember, Western Sudan is where you call West Africa today. It used to be called Sudan. Just bear that in mind. Which lasted through the 15th and 16th centuries and was only broken up by the Moors after their expulsion from Spain. 
you need to bear this important point in mind. While Melee or Melee and Songhai were building up their power, the Hausa states and Bono were also rising to prominence. The Hausa states formed the most important part of northern Nigeria and Hausa civilization is old, perhaps older than that of Songhai. But the sources of information available do not throw much light on its past. You see that very well. Such native records as may have existed have all disappeared with the exception of a few chronicles and even they do not go f very far back. In the last century, a history of the state from Arabic documents was compiled by Sultan Belo, the Fulani conqueror of Hausa land, but in his desire to obliterate all traces of the greatness of the defeated, he allowed the originals to be destroyed. So now, where did the Fulani come in from? And where did the Moors disappear to? That should be your question to ask, not us. Least we note that the Fulani destroyed the records of their houses after conquest. So these things are done so that the children or generation in the future will wake up to say, this was our land. You see how the houses have become slaves in their own land till tomorrow. There is even no uprising because any uprising, these moors now called Fulani will massacre the entire place. However you want to do it, if you doubt what we're saying, look at El Zazaki. Probably because he's not Fulani. But he's Muslim. They claim that your Islam supports their brothers and all that, which we all know is a very big lie from the pit of hell. So you see the thing. Now we want you to also ask yourself, while the same Muslims will be killing the so-called Christians with weapons made by the slave masters who also claim to be Christians and they pretend not to see. Right there you see that both are working together for the same goal and the same purpose but they pretend because they think the Negroes will not be able to decode what they are doing or what they are playing at. It goes further to say it is not known how long the Hausa race has been established in the Sudan or whence their civilization is derived. The Hausa language appears to be older than Arabic and has been classed in the Hamitic group of languages together with Coptic and Berber. The script for which Arabic characters are used is only about a century old. The weight of opinion favors the theory that the Hausa came of a mixed stock, not wholly indigenous. Certain facts point to an early connection with Egypt. But our interest is for you to see that the Hausas are Hamitic. And again, for those who think that the Hausa slaves were captured, no, those were Negroes living within the Hausas. The slave master were buying only the Negroes because they were peaceful, they were very intelligent, and they were, well, subservient, if one may say. Because they were not going to kill their master, they were also very intelligent, they had a lot of skills, they could manufacture metal, they could do a lot of things. And that's why the slave master is always looking for the negroes ahead of others. Here you see how smart the slave master is. He creates a people, gives them a name and creates a history for them. And here it says, according to the Hausa tradition, Biram, the father state, married diggers or diggera or something, a barber settler or settlement. And they had six children, Zaria, Katsina, Kano, Rano, Goba and Daura. Later, seven other states in which Hausa was not the original language were added to the family. So from six children they now have seven more added. They were Zamfara, Kebi, Guara, Yauri, Nupe, Yoruba and Kororofa, popularly called the bastard states. So you see how the slave master creates it. So he will go and brainwash their foot soldiers that these are what these people are. So if you notice, the Fulanis do not allow Negroes marry their daughters. That's because the slave master has already conditioned them to see them as slaves. Now ask yourself, but the same slave master would ha allow Negroes marry their own people unless their own race is different because it's just a, a bunch of cabal, a very heartless cabal that is doing all this. Just one group. Then it goes further to tell us that Hausas are an industrious people. Note this very well because they were destroyed by the Fulanese. Obviously the Moors who now rebranded as Fulanese, they were destroyed totally. And it goes further to say they are agriculturists, spinners, weavers, dyers, saddlers, metal workers. Note this very well. Potters, builders, hunters and above all traders. 
the black trader from Hausa land was already familiar to the Arabs of the 11th and 12th centuries and he is to be found today on the west coast, on the Mediterranean and on the Nile while his language has become the language of the commerce of the Western Sudan. Western Sudan is West Africa today. Remember they already planned that they will make the whole place to be turned to Hausa speaking. All the whole place. That's the language they adopted. But let's move forward. It says, the more intellectual of the Hausa has accepted Mohammedanism from the Babas and the masses were converted by the Fulani early in the 19th century. Paganism, even of the lowest type, still has its adherents in northern Nigeria, but for the most part it is of a higher order than the fetish worship of the coast and does not include human sacrifice or cannibalism among its practices. Now remember, one of the lies they told against the Negroes down on the southern part in what was still Negroland and Guinea was that they were sacrificing humans and that they were also cannibals so you need to bear that in mind but then let's move forward again to the more question we see that the empire of songhai which hitherto had met no serious opposition except from bono received its death blow through the moorish invasion the moors having been thrown back on north africa by their expulsion from spain found themselves harried by christian and Turk alike to the northwest corner of Africa, here cut off from all intercourse with their intellectual equals. Note this very well, their civilization rapidly decayed. At the close of the 16th century, in a last effort of energy, they attempted the conquest of the Sudan and in 1591 engaged in a fierce struggle with the Songhai Empire. With their superior arms, they carried all before them and the Songhais were everywhere defeated until at last the invaders found their match in the independent ruler of Kebi, a state on the north western border of Hausa land which had revolted from Songhai. But our interest is for you to see how the Moors metamorphosed to the Fulanese you see today. Now remember all the dates they mentioned there, the slave trade was still happening. So when these wars were going on, have you wondered who was doing the slave hunting and slave raiding or razzias for them? You need to put all these things in perspective and then connect the dots. So here again you see that thus it happened that the Hausa states and Bonu were practically unaffected by the advent of the Moors and were able to continue their trade with Tripoli and Egypt by the eastern caravan route. But Kano, once the dominating state of Hausa land, lost its prestige through a succession of incompetent rulers and during the 17th century suffered frequent defeat and invasion. As the power of Kano declined, Katsina already noted for its learning became the leading state and although it paid tribute to Bono, tribute is in slaves will note that very well, was virtually independent. And please follow this path very very closely and it says, its commerce was increased by the downfall of Songhai as it received some portion of that empire's trade. It was in Katsina that the excellent Hausa system of law was developed, which was adopted by the Fulani after their conquest of Hausa land. So our interest here is to ask you, this whole thing started with Moors invading and suddenly Moors disappeared and then the laws were adopted by the Fulani. Please read it and read it again too and tell us where the conquering Moors disappeared to because no one talks about them anymore. That's the ability of the slave master to remodel his foot soldiers in such a way that you won't know where they are coming from. So that if you were researching on let's say Moors now, you will be lost somewhere unless you are able to connect the dots between the Moors and the Fulani at least based on their attributes, based on their behavior based on their lies because these are just invaders all they understand is killing people the army belongs to them if you also doubt it the mere fact that the nigerian army does not arrest and kill full and herdsmen for killing others the law is for everyone else but them that proves it to you beyond any reasonable doubts so going further it still tells us about them it says towards the middle of the 18th century katsina found a formidable rival in the pagan state of goba but succeeded in resisting conquest. Now remember, it's likely the Goba were Negroes. During this time, the power of Kano partly revived, largely owing to its natural wealth 
and it became again the richest and busiest market of Houserland. The individual life of the house estates was suddenly checked at the outset of the 19th century by the remarkable development within their borders of the Fulani, a pastoral race of unknown origin. So now, how could such a people that have been mentioned everywhere be of unknown origin all of a sudden? They are obviously the Moors. So this is the slave master's game of remodeling or rebranding them, giving them a new name and new identity so that the conquest can con continue. So it goes further to say the Fulani may have come from India by way of Egypt. Within Africa, their movement has been from west to east. The Tariq tells how they were originally in the neighborhood of the Senegal, which you remember was where this whole story started. You saw how they were capturing slaves there too. And then it goes further to say, in the 9th century, a Fulani settlement existed at Masina, a town on the Niger between Jena and Timbuktu. One of their tribes was ruled by Ghana at the time at which El Bekri writes, in the reign of a Kano king named Yakub, circa 1402-1422, mention is made of their immigration into Hausa land and it is stated that that land was allotted to them in Kano and Zaria. The Fulani appear to have been converted to Mohammedanism by the Babas before the 13th century. They gradually spread through Hausa land where they lived in scattered communities, paying tribute to the various states, yet retaining their independence while individual Fulani were to be found everywhere as teachers and men of letters. Under the Songhai Empire, some of the Fulani of Katsina rallied to the revolt state of Kebi. But that's not our interest. Our interest is for you to see the link between the Moors and the Fulani. And if you notice, how could the people that were conquering and doing a lot of things suddenly be of no unknown origin? No known origin. And then the Moors disappeared. So that right there tells us all we need to know. Let us also reference Negroland or light thrown upon the dark continent, the history of African exploration and adventure as given in the leading authorities. And it was uh, by Charles H. Jones and with additions by Professor H. I. Williams and it was published 1881 and herein we see that large portions of the empire of Morocco are inhabited by the Moors, who are spread along the whole Mediterranean coast. They are a mixed race, grafted upon the ancient Mauritanian stock. They have, in course of time, incorporated with themselves, through intermarriages, much of the blood of the Arabs and of the Spaniards. Their language is Arabic. In bodily conformation, they considerably resemble Europeans. They are intellectual but cruel. That's our interest. If you notice, the Fulanese are exactly what they have said here. The same cruelty. These are people that if you tell them, why are you killing yourself? They will tell you, ah, Europe killed themselves too. That's all you will hear. If you doubt us, if you know any of them or any of their few soldiers, ask them, why are they killing themselves? Or you can even ask them something like, let's say Nam the Kano, for example. Ask them, what is his crime? For telling you to build your place? For telling you to allow the place develop? For telling you to allow businesses to thrive? So you see that their reasoning is not human reasoning. There is something wrong somewhere. But they must be the Moors. If you check very well, you see that the Fulanese are just the Moors. So it goes further to say that, and going further it says, they have had many revolutions among them, and these have been always most sanguinary. That means it has a lot of bloodshed. If you notice, they enjoy bloodshed more than anything. If you check Biafra, check Ambazonia, you see them doing their thing. Check the middle belt of Nigeria. You will see that it is this description matches them perfectly. So it's actually the Moors that became Fulanese and are terrorizing the whole area. So you see what we're talking about. So it goes further to say that they have been much given to piracy note it very well in religion they are mohammedan generally they are temperate in diet and plain in dress the rich however indulge in many luxuries and are fond of display there are wandering tribes which belong to them but very many the mass settle themselves as merchants mechanics and farmers 
the Arabs constitute no small portion of the population, but those are not our interest. Our interest is for you to see who were the Moors and who are the Fulanese. Compare both and you'll see that it is the slave master using the same group against the Negroes. And here again, he tells us that the people are chiefly Moors and Arabs. So you notice that Moors are perhaps different from Arabs. We don't know to what extent. And the principal town is Tunis. Tripoli is a Turkish province extending from Tunis to Egypt along the shores of the Mediterranean. Its extent is 200,000 square miles and the population 1,500,000. But then further down on the right you see where it says, of course vegetable and animal life exists but sparingly in oases where valleys or springs occur. The habitable parts of the Sahara are occupied by three different nations, the Moors, and Arabs in the extreme western portion, the Tuaregs in the middle part, and in the east a race resembling Negroes. The trade of the Sahara is in gold, slaves, ivory, iron, and salt. We see at least that the way they have been itemized shows that they are not the same as the Negroes. The Tuaregs are there, the Moors are there, the Arabs are there, which shows they are different people. And again, remember that the names are being changed by the slave masters to continue to use his foot soldiers against the Negroes. So let us in conclusion reference a history of colonization on the western coast of Africa by Archibald Alexander and it was published 1846. And there we see that Mongo Park was killed by a party of these people while descending the Quora. They may be supposed to occupy the banks of the unknown river from its rise to its termination. But then, apart from that, our interest is on the right where it says the Felatas, that's the Fulanese, are so denominated by the Negroes, but the name by which they call themselves is Felan, which might be more accurately written Fulan according to the sound of the syllables. The origin of the term Felatas is not known, but as they are anthropocletes, like the Tuaregs, and still Negroes to make slaves of them, it is probably an appellation of reproach. Remember one of the comments told us that it is their name, their name is Fulani and all that. They have many names because of who they are. And he goes further to say, like that of Sigo, given to these later, they are known on the Senegal and Gambia as Fulas. And Pauls, you remember where the guy said they are Pauls or Paul or whatever he chose to call it. Now, like we told you, the slave master rightly said they lack both humanity and common sense, which you would have seen even from their activities in the area till tomorrow morning. So you see how he claims he's Paul. Apparently because they know that when you tell a Negro that something has something to do with God, he gives up. He leaves it for you. So apparently they are now saying they are Paul. So that some Negroes will think that, oh, it's coming from the Most High, it's a lie. So going further, we see where it says, They are known as on the Senegal and Gambia as Fulas and Poles. Mongo Park described them under the first denomination, that's Fulas, and M. Mullin under the second. The Felatas extend from the Atlantic to the confines of Darfur and speak everywhere the same language. And of course, here, we come to the end of this edition of The Placebo Effect for Negroes, A Reply, Part 1. We thank you very much for listening and we do encourage you to find time to conduct your own research or at least look for the materials referenced and study them yourself. We thank you very much once again for listening. Peace.